and has also previously served as the research director at the Center for Social Entrepreneurship Enterprise. Sorry, this is where my dyslexia gets wild. Uh, Center for Social Enterprise and Social Investment in the China Philanthropy Research Institute. Uh, today, she's presenting Penalty or Reward. Role of hybrid identities in social entrepreneur enterprises and resource acquisition. Thank you. Um, so my name is Chen Ji. I'm from Lily Firm School of Philanthropy, IUPUI. Uh, today I'm very pleased to present this work, co-authored with Sarah Kenres, uh, entitled of Penalty or Reward: The Role of Hybrid Identities in Social Enterprises Resource Acquisition. So this research is actually motivated by two observations. The first one is under the context of the borrowing of sector. Where social entrepreneurship has been and practitioners' communities, um, because social enterprises have been considered as an effective and efficient way to uh, being financial sustainable while also combating some social issues in a complex um, environment. So um, by definition, social enterprises are hybrid organizations that use commercial operations to address social issues. Uh, I'm gonna give you several examples of what are social enterprises. So the first one is uh, Husk Power Systems, and it is a for-profit organization uh, which is converting rice husks and to um, provide powers to the villagers in rural uh, India. And so the social mot motivation of this uh, company is to um, provide some social services to the disadvantaged populations. And the other one uh, most of us should be very familiar with is Goodwill. So it is a nonprofit organization, but it is also adopting some commercial activities to generate some income. So these are very good examples of uh, the hybrid organizations, how they combine both the uh, financial motivations and their social motivations. So although um, there are some prior literatures uh, discussing the relationship between the organizational form of social enterprises and their ab ab ability to get access to financial resources, uh, very few studies have been examining the relationship between hybridity, which is a very important characteristics of social enterprises, and its relations to their financial resource acquisition ability. And the second uh, motivation is that the prior literature has assumed that the financial resource acquisition is a one-sided process. Um, that is to say that the success of organizations financial uh, resource acquisition uh, mostly depends on their own organizational capability or their strategies. Um, however, in these um, context of social entrepreneurship or the blur blurring of the sectors. Um, so we have to notice that the resource acquisition process is not a one-sided process, but a more interactive uh, uh, process between resource seekers and resource providers. So combining with our first op observation, this study aims to examine the relationship between the hybridity of social enterprises and their resource acquisition outcomes, especially in relations to uh, the heterogeneous uh, external stakeholders. And that leads to our main research question. So we're uh, asking a question that is what factors are associated with um, social enterprises resource acquisition, especially how do resource providers in this study, they are philanthropic donors and equity investors vary in their evaluation of the new ventures and making investment decisions. Um, so empirically, uh, we're going to test this by comparing the resource acquisition outcomes between traditional nonprofits and social enterprises when seeking for philanthropic donations. And also comparing um, the uh, resource acquisition outcomes between social enterprises and traditional for profits when seeking for equity investment. So we're building these conceptual framework based on two theoretical lenses. First one is we're finding a of institutions. Um, so this is a framework 
for identifying um, different strategies, norms, and rules as unique types of um, institutional statements. And there basically are different perspectives to approach this. And in this study, we are focusing more on the intention-centric perspectives that we're using the aims of the organizations to define their um, institutional logics. And we use two dimensions, the financial motives, um, motives and social motives. So here we can see that here is the hybrid spectrum of the organizational forms. In traditional nonprofits, they are um, some organizations with nonprofit orientations and they're having very explicit social motives. In traditional for-profits, they're um, from the financial dimension, they're for-profit orient orientated oriented and they have explicit social uh, they don't have explicit social motives while well, social enterprises they are there is a hybridity between these two dimensions so they're for profit oriented but they also have explicit social motive um so same for from the resource provider size um, so for the philanthropy donors they are non-profit oriented and they have explicit social motive and for profit, uh, so equity investors, they are formally oriented and, and they don't have any explicit social motive. So the second uh, theoretical lens that uh, we're using as a foundation is the venture identification concept. So um, this is to say that under the uncertain and complex environment, the pro uh, resource providers are more um, so they're making decisions more based on their own experiences. So they are tend to choosing those organizations there um, that share more similar um, overlapping attributes with their own. And um, the hypothesis is that the higher level of the overlap between the resource seeker attributes and resource provider attributes may lead to a higher level of venture adaptation, and that will lead to a higher level of uh, the likelihood of providing a resource. So here in our studies, our resource seekers uh, include nonprofits, social enterprises, and for-profits. And um, from the resource provider side, there are landlord donor and equity investors. And there are both uh, uh, ma matched attributes and mismatched attributes between Philanthropy donors and social enterprises and equity investors and social enterprises. So that leads to our two sets of um, hypotheses. And we're hypothesizing that there can be two effects um, with this matched and mismatched attributes. When the matched attributes overrides the mismatched, that will lead to a halo effect. Uh, means that philanthropy donors and equity investors will treat the social enterprises similar to their traditional counterparts. Uh, there can be a staying effect, uh, which is when the mismatched attributes override mass, uh, matched attributes. In this way, uh, philanthropy donors or the equity investors may penalize uh, social enterprises comparing to their traditional counterparts. So we're testing that uh, hypothesis with mm -hmm. some empirical data. We're using the data from uh, entrepreneurship uh, database program, uh, which collected the uh, organizational level data from um, the early stage ventures around the world. And our put data set, our sample is a put cross, cross sectional data set, contains more than 8,000 observations between the year of uh, 13 to 19. So, mm -hmm. Here are the measures of our key uh, variables. For the dependent variables, we're using uh, both the binary variables and numerical variables uh, in terms of philanthropic donation and equity investments. So the first sets are the binary variables. Have you ever received um, philanthropic donations? Yes or no. And have you ever received equity investments since your funding? Yes or no. And the second sets are how much have you received? And our independent variables are the different forms of uh, organizations based on that different attributes. We have nonprofit, traditional nonprofit, social enterprises, and for profits. We also have several control variables. 
And so the main analytical strategy is to compare um, the resource acquisition outcomes between nonprofits mm -hmm. and social enterprises when seeking philanthropy funding. And the second is to compare the for-profits versus social enterprises uh, when they're seeking for equity funding. So we're using logistic regression and topic regression respectively. And here are the uh, main findings. Uh, we can see from this form that basically social enterprises are way less likely to receive philanthropy donations comparing to their nonprofit counterparts. Well, for the uh, when they're seeking for equity investment, equity investors um, treated them similarly to their for profit counterparts. And when it comes to the amount of uh, the equity investment that they get, um, they have even higher probability to get the, the investment comparing to their for profit counterparts. So um, we partially confirmed um, part of our halo effect hypothesis and hypothesis, but in different settings. Okay, so here are some uh, conclusions. So the first one, a very important one, is that uh, we examine that hybridity doesn't always benefit social enterprises, um, specifically in terms of financial resource acquisition. And we also uh, improve, uh, prove that, um, so the attitudes, philanthropic donors and equity investors may have different attitudes toward um, hybrid, especially the mismatch in identity may affect philanthropic donor more. And we also, our results have some practical implications for the social enterprises. Yeah. They can have different um, communication strategies when communicating with their external stakeholders. Okay, there are some um, several strengths in our um, study include <laughs> so uh, the testing the relationship between hybridity and their resource acquisition, and we're basically proposing two uh, contrasting theories, and we tested it, and also that we demonstrate the importance of examining how different types of founders um, allocate financial resources to different organizational types. But also there are limitations, of course. In the first ones is that it might be very hard to distangle mm -hmm. the influence of legal restrictions from venture identification because we're using the legal status as the measures of um, financial dimension, the financial attributes. And that, although, um, for example, there will be more barrier for the philanthropic donors to uh, invest in the for-profit social enterprises, while these barriers for the equities um, don't exist at the same level. So this is one limitation. And the second one is, um, given that the data is collected from the social enterprises side, we have limited data from the founder side. So we actually have limited understanding of the actual maximum uh, in terms of the decision-making process. Some future directions where future studies can, um, can be conducted to address these limitations. So the first one is that we can use some experimental methods to further ex uh, explore the mechanism. And the second one is that we can also um, take account into some other institutional factors um, for example, some um, factors like economic preferences and cultural psychological variables um, to test how does these institutional context may influence um, social enterprises resource acquisition. So these are all about this research and we welcome all the feedbacks and questions and suggestions for our thinking. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take questions now. Do something in the chat too. Uh, that was me just writing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> question if nobody else wants to go. Yeah, so this is really interesting and, and you really sort of pointed out some really um, important directions and, and things to consider moving forward. I do wonder, oh, Brian also has a question. Perfect. Um, 
I do wonder, I couldn't, I, it, it, it was a little too fast for me uh, when you went over the control variable. I was curious if you looked at profitability of the social enterprise versus the for-profit enterprise. Um, you have revenue, but I'd be curious, it might be useful to just run the analysis without the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Just because so, those are all going to be zero, right? There's no profitability in the nonprofit, um, uh, and or I mean, unless unless you're conceiving of something differently than I'm understanding it, but I'd be curious if there's some difference in terms of understanding. You know, it seems to me like what you've suggested is that it, what you found is that um, venture capitalists are are, uh, you know, sort of are more interested in investing in social enterprises than straight up for profit. I'd be I would really be interested to see what happens if you make sure to control for profitability from the perspective mm -hmm. of the investor. Yeah, um, so are you, are you suggesting that because nonprofit can't generate revenue and that could be a problem that... No, I'm suggesting that 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 you've got some interesting results when it comes yeah. to the social enterprise versus the for-profit enterprise. Yeah. But you can't really look at the role of profitability if you include nonprofit in the group because all of those are going to be zero, and so they're going to potentially bias a lot of your estimates. So what you might do is do an additional just sub um, population analysis, mm -hmm. looking at um, the effect of um, the difference between social enterprises and for profit, removing the nonprofit just for the purpose yeah. of this one analysis. Yeah. To understand if profitability or how profitability may or may not affect your results, right? I would expect since you found this already, right? Like you should, it shouldn't matter, <laughs> frankly, very much if since social profit, social enterprise already came out ahead. But I would just be curious. I would think that'd be really interesting. Thank you. That's that's a great point. And we actually have uh, have done the additional analysis, excluding. You sort of stopped me like ten minutes ago. <laughs> I, yeah, I should have mentioned that. <laughs> it's being respectful. <laughs> <laughs> because, because the main purpose is to just compare the prices for profits. So uh, in the uh, additional analysis, we exclude the non-profits we are doing this comparison and the results just remain the same, remain consistent. So yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> In the future, just cut me off. <laughs> oh, I should. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, next is Brian. Okay, good. And that's the slide I was interested in. Um, so, I guess first, just from the technical and data analysis and presentation point of view, to ask whether you've taken these coefficients and followed them through and done an illustration of what they actually mean in terms of how much money, either for a medium-sized enterprise or a couple of scales or something like that, which is useful just for getting a feeling for, okay, how big a difference are mm -hmm. we talking about in terms of how much funding these groups are getting? And then the question I have, but maybe I'm missing something, if the idea is that the social enterprise can get the best of both to kind of do good and do well, have business discipline and contribute to broader goals, hypothetically, are the social enterprises able to do better because they're getting money from both sources or are these results saying they're doing worse than the other two alternatives? I guess I'm not clear on what that what the comparisons mean thank you yeah so thank you for that question um basically uh, our halo effect um is um is echoes with uh, the point that you mentioned earlier that uh why there is a halo effect so you can get access to close the resources from blended donors and equity masters so that uh, kind kind of provide a addictive impact for the social enterprises in terms of financial resource acquisition. And uh, in terms of how do we um, then the results? So we, because I only present the uh, main uh, results here, but we also have the um, like 
uh, ratios and uh, the average um, marginal effect uh, when, we, when we do the uh, logistic regression and um, tobit regressions to uh, report the uh, effect. And just to, yeah, we somehow simplify uh, how we present the, the findings. So thanks for, for that points. Okay, I think I'm gonna follow up because again, I'm not clear of what this means. If I'm a social enterprise, your results say mm -hmm. I'm better off choosing one or the other mm -hmm. that I've gotten the worst of both worlds. Is that what these mm -hmm. coefficients mean or not? And again, translating it into mm -hmm. an example with money amounts would be helpful in terms of a kind of intuition of you know, what the coefficients mean. Thank you. Yes. So uh, basically, when it comes to the practical implication, uh, our results actually suggested that uh, if you are a social enterprise uh, and you are searching for you are seeking for resources from equity investors, and that's fine for you to um, imp imply your hybridity, like you can you can communicate with them that I have financial um, return expectations and I also have social motives, but if your target audience is the philanthropic donors, you might be very careful about how you're communi communicating your um, financial return expectations because that might backfire you when you're communicating with philanthropic donors, and that will lead to a penalty. Okay, so you're saying in terms of targeting the message, this helps, yes. and yeah. maybe this design doesn't answer the question I have then. You know, <laughs> are there advantages to being a social enterprise? But I asked a bunch. I'll stop here. <laughs> Can I go? Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, uh, I was thinking something like this. It's um, so you have a bunch of organizations looking yeah. for funding. You have a bunch of donors looking for organizations to pour their their, their funds. Okay, so. I expect that everything is in some kind of equilibrium. And then if there is one form of organization that dominates the other, mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. uh, you will go to kind of a corner solution in which that's the only one that will end up happening. So given that we observe different forms, I would you know, suspect that they are serving different purposes. And then essentially one form dominates for some, uh, goals and other form dominates for other goals yeah. and because of that maybe they are not comparable they are not apple they were comparing apples versus oranges now so essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sorry sorry uh, sorry brian no I, no I couldn't hear you so yeah, i think he meant to say that to himself I didn't even try. Oh, I didn't <laughs> so again so it's uh maybe it's kind of a mix of a comment slash slash question and i i don't know much about uh philanthropy so it's like take it from somebody that's uh, pretty ignorant of the topic so essentially yeah so that's a very good point uh, th this is actually a myth that practitioners and scholars um, have in mind that so our the purpose of this study is just to unpack this myth to answer the question um so should, should you just stick to the traditional um, target uh, founders that you are familiar with? Or um, is there any other ways that you can benefit for yourself to also access to other kind of um, stakeholders or uh, potential founders? And so the answer for that question is that if you are like traditionally you are familiar with philanthropic donors and uh, you're comfortable with uh, communicating your social motives, and that might be very dangerous for you to um, be uh, social enterprises, like transform from a nonprofit to uh, social enterprises and to um, try to get access to um, some the, um, financial resource from blend with donors as you previously used to do. Can I have a follow up? What I'm saying is like, yeah. Probably the organizations are aware of this, and there were some that they, they still pick some organizational form. Mm -hmm. So I could say, again, 
So the, the, the comparison in the empirical part could be very biased because you are comparing some that rationally decided to go in this direction um, yeah. versus some that rationally decided to do not pick that direction. So it's, it's not clear what what the coefficients will tell you. No? So it's, uh, you need to you need to exploit some kind of exogenous jog that force some organizations to move to move in one direction or the other and then see what happened with fundraisers to be able to you know credible um have some credibility on the on the estimations no yes yeah that makes total sense yeah to add, i mean to sort of one question is right a i totally uh, absent any useful knowledge of the following question which is <laughs> It seems to me that the idea of social enterprises are not actually that old. Is that accurate? It's not. Or is not actually that old as an organizational form. Yes. As such, is it the case that you could look early on before it is likely to be any clear expectation or idea as to how funders would treat this kind of organization to try to have us, you know, essentially to sort of control choose a subsample of your of your population, right, mm -hmm. to, to sort of focus on that early time period where you would not necessarily reasonably be able to expect that they would have some mm -hmm. capacity to accurately choose the appropriate form, organizational form, to maximize the revenue likelihood, like their likelihood of attracting revenue. I know if I, I don't want to, but it's, uh, so I would also be careful to define what you mean by a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. It's like, are we talking about the nonprofit that was about to yeah. uh, human rapsy and then they were forced to do some for profit yeah. thing? Uh, <laughs> destroy the case. And then in that case, I think donors would say, excellent management. You keep this alive when it was about to die. Yeah. So I don't care how you did it. So now let's let's talk about it. Versus a for profit firm that in an opportunistic way is trying to look as a social enterprise. Okay. That would be a very different thing. And then I think donors are not silly. They will, you know, again, I totally understand that organizations are to some extent opaque. They're not fully, you know, you don't see through everything. But again, if you are willing to pour money at very least some idea on, on, on what the organizations are and what they are doing, probably you have some idea. So it's a, um, so the, again, that social enterprise could be, you know, it's in some sense the for profit and the pure non profit are the two extremes of an of an spectrum, and then the social enterprise is everything in the middle. Though no? it seems, yeah. so it's. Um... Okay. Uh, Angie, I was going to hit on something similar. Mm -hmm. So, at the August conference that Scott and I go to, the lawyers were looking at some of this in terms of uptake of use of this new business form mm -hmm. and my understanding is <clears throat> there's tons of other reasons that you don't jump into being a social enterprise mm -hmm. yeah. including all kinds of extra I mean there's some states that basically it's just like hey change your checkbox next year for your registration versus a total shift in entire management structure mm -hmm. yeah and so part of what I wonder is how much of that is signaling or messaging as well, right? So if what you've got is a nonprofit that moves into a different corporate structure, there's a much different signal than I think it was the state of oh, one of the Southern states, maybe South Carolina, South Carolina, maybe that literally said, Hey, we've come up with this brilliant idea. We want to be entrepreneurial, check this box and we'll let you be a social enterprise. We don't even have a clue what the hell that means. Mm -hmm. We literally don't even have a clue um, what it means. We don't have a structure, we don't have anything, but let's see what happens. And they're either treating it like one of these legal sandboxes. Mm -hmm. That signals nothing, literally nothing. Mm -hmm. but, a, but it's a much different signal. If you've got a nonprofit and you're suddenly making the shift to social enterprise in a system that demands structural change, not just you know a simple filing, and so that that just prompts me to wonder what other signals might need to be considered in in your in your experiment. Yes. Um, and then the other thing I, I throw out there, and my brain always goes to examples because I understand things much better in examples. So I'm trying to think of that organization 
that is almost the stain effect, right? That mismatch. But, but what if my social enterprise is the social part of it is a commitment to something that is not necessarily widely socially acceptable? Mm-hmm. If there's an impact on that as well, right? And I think of all the controversies that we have happening all over the place about somebody supports free Palestine, doesn't support, you know, these, these are very clear positive messages in some communities and very clear not positive messages in other communities. Mm-hmm. And so I, it, it just intrigues me whether or not that messaging, um, you know, also impacts this as well. That's, that's great. And I don't know the answer to that. That is yeah. not a trick question. It's no, nothing no, like getting no. a question like that. I don't mean that as a trick question. I mean it as I generally am, am thinking this through. Yeah, that that would be great. Interesting questions to be tested in the experiment. So I will tell you that the, the use the there are databases in all of the states where businesses register, and or not all of the states, mm-hmm. in a lot of the states, and that's what they were drawing. Lawyers, lawyers can't do this. So they, they were literally just looking at registrations. It was literally just sort of an Excel sheet. Um, here, they've had six registrations in this state. They've had three reg. but there are 35 in this state. What happened? Everyone went, yeah, there's no legal requirement. You just check them out. <laughs> and you get the benefit of being a nonprofit in terms of tax. And everybody was like, oh, it is. So yeah. my guess is if you wanted to add a little of that, if you need it, mm-hmm. it's probably not hard to find. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a great cool. suggestion. Mm-hmm. Uh, got you, Bernie, and then Scott. So I'm trying to put this in uh, more of a, an applied situation, mm-hmm. an applications guy rather than deep research. And so I realize it's this social enterprises, this middle ground, has got at least a potential for a profit motive, whereas nonprofits don't have the profit motive. And I suspect a lot of the donors mm-hmm. don't know the difference. Uh, I'm thinking, and, and I, when I'm thinking of donors, I'm thinking of yeah. my generation, senior <laughs> people, um, retired, have accumulated wealth, are trying to figure out what to do with it, and they're being bombarded by a variety of players. Uh, yeah, that's so great. And so, how does this, I suspect in your research, you're not really looking at that per se. Mm-hmm. So by philanthropic donors, actually our data includes those ones from uh, some organizations like foundations, those institutional donors. Uh, although we also have data points from individual donors, but we... we and, I, and I'm not thinking of institutional donors, now. I'm thinking of individuals and not institute. Because institutions are, you know, they've got, mm-hmm. they've got access to lawyers, and they can check some. They might check some of this stuff out. I'm thinking of the individual who can make a sizable donation potentially, mm-hmm. and is being approached. And I'll say, I will use the example of a local nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And my brain is thinking, trying to get some feel for what your research may be telling me there. Yes, I should be more. Yeah, I should clarify what we included as uh, philanthropy donation resources. Um, so in this study, actually, we are referring those institutional donors um, or instead of individual donors. But we also realize that it's important to understand um, individual donors' perceptions when they making such kind of decisions. And that's why we believe that experimental method, experiment, experimental studies will be uh, very um, appropriate way to to test that. We haven't done that yet. No, not yet. <laughs> I won't push any farther on that. <laughs> even, even though I'd like to. <laughs> you got a question? Yeah, just a quick one. I really just kind of a comment. So I'm no expert in the history of corporate governance, but I did write a little bit on it. And one of our colleagues, uh, Tim Fort, um, has written a lot on it. And I, from what I remember, because uh, we co-authored something together a while back, some of the original corporate forms in Rome were actually benefit corporations. They were public benefit corporations. And over time, uh, that obviously the arc has been quite long. But the current trend toward, you know, for example, benefit corporations and nonprofits is in some ways a return to form. So I don't know how much history you want to bring into your 
paper, this paper or otherwise, but you know, some of that you know historical context could be interesting to look yeah. through because there's been a lot of studies to see how those various types of organizations have functioned throughout history and what what kind of public ends they've helped to further. Um, so I'm happy to I, after, after this weekend I, I can share some links and I can introduce you to Tim as well because he's written a lot on this. Oh, that would be great. Thank he's you. a really nice guy too. Yes. <laughs> He's one of those that actually plays guitar in class. So, <laughs> <laughs> great presentation, Mira, uh, and great work. Um, some suggestions which go back to profitability and make a distinction between profits and non profits mm -hmm. is looking at the returns because this is what matters and comparing similar groups mm -hmm. and find if there is a return premium. Because I have seen some literature. Uh, actually suggesting that being a social enterprise can create superior performance. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, if you find that, it means that you are getting an advantage from, from having a social enterprise character. So looking at the returns and how uh, they mm -hmm. can be compared with other groups might be very, very useful. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. I will look into the data set and to figure out if, there's any way to include that to, to our analysis. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually gonna jump in before you, Ryan. Um, one of the things that kind of uh, was going through my mind as you were presenting is very similar to what everyone else is saying. Is what role does certainty or uncertainty kind of play in this relationship? Mm -hmm. um, I know, Nonprofits tend to not be the most um, stable organizations. Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if you uh, thought about some way to incorporate, um, and this can go back to their port tenure um, when they switch or something, to specifically show that it's hey, it's not uncertainty; it's this social enterprise thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are, are you suggesting that comparing to for profit forms of organizations, nonprofits sometimes signal in uncertainty to external founders. So this is again fully if I'm understanding. So a social a social enterprise is one which has some kind of profit mechanism in it. Yeah. Um, versus a nonprofit doesn't have that mm -hmm. and they rely on funding, yeah. uh, which inherently makes their existence yeah. much more likely to just disappear one day. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if investors kind of are tagging onto that and, um, so instead of this, this mission matching, mm -hmm. if it's just a certainty that, Hey, this is my investments worth stake mm -hmm. and fully on my field. So if that's a <laughs> very silly question, feel free to just say like, okay, and move on. <laughs> okay. Um, so <laughs> I just want to, uh, uh, so yeah, make a, clarif a clarification is that, so for equity investors, we only compare the social enterprises and for-profit organizations. So um, yeah, nonprofit are out of our um, comparison group. Okay. And so we only compare nonprofits with social enterprises when in the scenario of seeking for philanthropy donation. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes more sense. Thank um, you. And then Brian, you're up. Okay, good. Uh, so first, just to start, um, to what extent you've considered or may want to consider whether there are cases where donors are more discriminating. And I know just in popular literature stuff about Silicon Valley, people made a lot of money, but uh -huh. they want to do something different from traditional uh, nonprofits so that they may be actively looking for, you know, a hybrid organization. And then the other part, including from, you know, working and being part of nonprofits, um, is there's a whole set of issues and all kinds of rules about which things nonprofits can do that bring in money and, you know, moral hazard risks because nonprofits, if you've got a great source of money, you can pay your directors and officers very well, have great offices and campus you know whole space for how that's used and and you there are ways in times which you can build up assets or carry over funding again there are rules about it and i presume there's probably a whole literature analyzing that which would seem to offer some insights into this question of kind of institutional choice of you know 
when would people want to set themselves up or stay as a nonprofit and when would they choose to become a for-profit enterprise? And certainly seems to me looking at some of that literature and what it may suggest for hypotheses for further research could be interesting. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, mentioning that point. Uh, so we actually uh, have some proposition of the uh, possible mechanism be um, behind the halo effect and sting effect that we propose. So uh, we're about to test that later in the experiment. That is um, just like what you mentioned, and there are some literature suggesting that there might be a mechanism of a win-win situation that people believe that you can um, create um, social, social impact as well as financial return. That is one thought. And the other thought might be um, some people believe that there might be a trade-off between the uh, social return and financial financial return. And from the um, evidence from the reality and evidence from the literature, it seems like that it might be because philanthropy donors, they are more tend to buy in that trade-off um, thought. And those equity investors, like you said, the people from Silicon Valley, they, they tend to believe more in the win-win situation that um, you can do do good and do well at the same time. So uh, we're not so sure about that, but it would be very interesting to test that in the experiment. Thanks. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, um, very concrete question. So Indiana University, how we, classified Indiana University? Mm -hmm. No, non-for-profits or a social enterprise? Uh, in my definition, it, it, it should be non-profit. What's the difference between goodwill? So essentially most, most of our income is coming from essentially what our customers paid with tuition, with some small contributions by the state and probably tiny contribution from grants and donors. Yeah. So essentially we are even closer to maybe for-profit that, do, that don't pay taxes rather than a um, for profit. <laughs> yeah, one element of the uh, you definition is that whether you, <laughs> whether you, oh, we've had this conversation so many times in so many different places. We're like, uh. yeah, well, so you have an idea. So essentially, uh, yeah. what, what's 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 the classification? And, and the other thing is like, uh, in the case of for profits, I don't really understand what donors are. Because investors essentially they get rights they get stocks and they, they get rights to the return and then uh potentially depending on what what, what the stock is you have rights to uh, vote for the you know the, the board of directors so on and so forth so um what does it mean to be a donor for a for-profit organization can you do that so I, i'm sure that they, they will. Uh, yeah so first uh, about the definition of nonprofits and social enterprises. Uh, I think the main difference is that whether you adopt commercial activities. Uh, the reason why I define goodwill as social enterprises is because they have those commercial activities. But for as for Indiana University, uh, yeah, we, I, from my side, I can't, I uh, really see the commercial activities and maybe the business plan behind its operation model. So that's one thing. And for the second question, um, like, is, is it possible for philanthropic donors to put money in the for-profit organizations? Uh, the answer is yes. So, uh, so in the philanthropy uh, field, there is uh, activity called uh, program related investment. And that, that is way that foundation can put money to really invest money to the uh, for-profit organizations. And they can also count uh, this part of money as their charitable expense and they can get tax benefit from it. So that's one way to do that. And also there are um, some other ways that um, like mission related investment that uh, foundations like philanthropy donors, institutional donors, they can put money to the uh, for-profit organizations to achieve their own social mission. Yeah. But the more we listen to more, that sounds like it's still a different data generating process where it seems like the research, or at least the analysis 
should be, and feel free to push back or maybe I misunderstood this, should be how do you, you know, like, do donors treat social enterprises different from nonprofits? And do investors treat social enterprises different from for profits? Yes. Is that actually how you did it? Yes. Okay. So there are actually two separate sets of analyses here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that, that is a little bit confusing in the chart that you presented. Yeah. It, it, this is going back to the comparing. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. So they're really completely separate. So my so my next real question, that was just a clarifying question. Mm-hmm. Um the next steps, the, what's um, are you going to look at the donor and like you said, you're thinking of doing an experiment. Is it a list experiment? Oh, I don't know what's happening here. Mm. Uh, you've been using the mouse. Yeah, it? so the um, experiment. I bet the mouse interview. Inter- no, I have it. I hope okay. you're good. Okay. <laughs> then, yeah. uh, the experiment will be to really explore uh, the mechanism, like the reason why. Uh, for example, filling the donors choose uh, nonprofits over social enterprises, and we can control um, many factors um, that we cannot do that in this um, using secondary data analysis. So it'll be a survey. It'll be a list, like a survey experiment to donors and to nonprofit and to mm-hmm. investors. Yeah. But can you be an investor in a non-profit, non-for-profit? Um, you mean uh, if equity investors can fund non-profits? Um, but they are donors. No, no. That, that's the reason that's why. why no. okay, they're two separate. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason why. Yeah. Uh, we put he's an analyzing two separate. Yeah. Groups, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that's the reason. So that's the reason why we only compare... Uh, yeah, that's the reason why we only compare the like uh, equity investors, uh, equity investment. We only uh, p- compare social enterprises and traditional for profits. The reason why is that equity investors cannot put money to the nonprofits. But so, so yeah, in your presentation, as you as you do this again, it would be super helpful to even have two separate page, like two separate slides. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. we're not still talking about the same confusion. Yes, yeah. um, include some examples, like what where benefit for corporations, for example, fall, and the accreditation standards for B corps versus social enterprises vary as well. Yeah. And they have impacts on things like tax advantages for investors, that kind of, or donors. <laughs> is Where does ESG fit in all of this, right? Because ESG is really particular, largely we think about it in terms of for-profit mm-hmm. companies that are doing things in the most social responsibility. And it would be interesting to see when you do your experiment, mm-hmm. whether investors differentiate between social enterprises yeah. Versus for profits with very strong ESG portfolios. Yes, right. Because the difference there is that the social enterprise get a tax benefit. Hypothetically, a company with a very good ESG record is essentially doing something very similar, but not getting a tax benefit. Is that yes. something that you're considering? Yes. Uh, yeah, I I think that yeah, ESG can be part of the social enterprises in our sample, because in our sample, how we define social enterprises are those with for-profit legal status and with explicit social motives. And that essentially is what you're Mm -hmm. referring to, the ESG ones. But the problem with ESG though, right, is that some of that is completely greenwashing. Yeah. <laughs> literally just here's our web page that says what we're doing and there's no way to evaluate right? like yeah. and, and yes. right and then there's companies who are actually you, know, you look at texas right like this is super fascinating right the yeah. companies have decided to leave texas as opposed to abandon their mm-hmm. esg which means that they must actually have sunk some costs into it likely right mm-hmm. and that's different from mm-hmm. like and so the question there is yeah. that like does that make those for profits part of your social enterprise because they're strongly committed to their ESG ideals? Mm-hmm. That's not their. That's not the explicit goal of an oil company in Texas, even if they have. I mean, even if they have a strong ESG component. So you get again, you get to this problem of like where, how, what side of the line does it fall on, and and by whose designation in that context, especially when you when you think about these. Yes. Yeah. You know, at least moderately good performing <laughs> large scale for profits. 
But is that, is that, sorry, was there someone else on the line? Does that really start getting into a, a different set of questions? Because, and I, and I ask this because now suddenly, if I'm an investor or a donor, quite honestly, either one, probably, there's already research on whether or not I actually care if you do it or I just get the signaling benefit of, of investing in a place. Right? There's, there's already, so you're adding a new issue. Is that okay? I, I don't know. I don't do this, <laughs> right? So my question is, can you are, you are you adding too much in there that you're gonna get this really strange level of complexity that's just gonna scatter shot an outcome? Because now you're having to think about investor knowledge, investor slash donor knowledge. Because I get the signal from investing in a company that's con that's committed to ESG, whether or not it's proper. Is this a recording? No. Whether or not it's <laughs> or not, if I invest in there, I get the signal. Right? Everybody's into Bed Bath and Buddy or whatever the hell. You know. Okay. So you, you throw money at this group, and then it turns out, oh, they've got child labor produced. And that's not true. That's why I asked them the recording. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so there are, there is research on how much right. I should have to redo. Or do I just get the benefit of the signal for doing the investment? It's interesting though, because then, because if you can essentially group for profits and social yeah. enterprises along a spectrum of degree of actual investment or commitment to ESG goals, whatever, however you want to do that, right? Yeah. You would like the set of questions you're then asking may not only be about the importance of those commitments, but how much the legal status tactic, to your earlier point, right. actually matters, right. right? Right. Is the legal status a, way, a commitment device mm -hmm. by these companies to their ESG goals, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is yeah. another version of this question, which I right. think is really another slightly different direction than yeah. you've been working on it. Mm -hmm. But it's super interesting, right? Because the, then at that point, the real difference is the legal designation. Yep. Yeah. And, the, and the, of course, the tax benefit, right? right. But like, is... I mean, to my mind, then what does a for-profit lose by going set up a social enterprise? Uh, there might be the trade-off between their financial return to and a social return because sometimes their uh, shareholders may think that if you um, put money to a social enterprise comparing to a for-profit, you might lose um, potential. But the research says that ESG improves financial outcomes. Um, okay. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. I'll stop talking. We have a finance professor here. Well. <laughs> I suspect that there might be a substitution effect between philanthropic donation and equity investment. So the balance could move more towards traditional non-profits when it's more philanthropic donation uh -huh. or towards traditional for-profits when there is more uh, yeah. equity investment. But you might get a premium when investors believe, okay, you know, this is very close to traditional for-profit, but it also serves some social goals. Yeah. You might get the, yeah. the social premium there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this depends on the returns that you're going yeah. to get some other, you know, indexes. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, uh, but yeah, that's very research. I mean, you know, it's... A... <laughs> Papers you have yeah. to write yeah. out of. Oh, <laughs> The outcome. Yeah. <laughs> it just prompted me to try to remind myself. Yeah, that's a PhD so project for you. Is this your? Is this a PhD? Yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, stop hard. listening. <laughs> <laughs> this is really well done. It's very interesting, right? We do this a lot of times, and then you're like, "Oh, uh, you're a PhD student. My bad. Not a postdoc who's like got a lifetime." Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Your PhD. This was really cool. And when you can get the group of us talking like this, and by the way. The other thing I would suggest is, is that you you answer are answering questions well. Your slides sh are not allowing you to tell us how smart you are, right? So that's why I apologize. I'm like, oh, if that was too hard. And then you rocked it. And I was like, nope, then you should have taken this on. So your slides need to, to reflect your rock star because you've answered really hard questions. So be brave and, and have your slides not just be the summary, but be like, I know this is the question I'm going to get. Let me explain to you, right? Here's the question about investor donor. It has no definition up there. It's the investor donor. Let me rock star your world and explain these things, <laughs> right? Those type of yeah. things. Um, but this is really impressive. I, I would love to have more. There's a lot of us in this room who are like, this is really cool. This is four more projects if you want it. To. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Right. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want it to end, but I remember doing these as a PhD. You're like, what the hell? That's like PhDs. I'm never going to graduate. I think that like follow up of what Anshu was saying is something that could be useful. It's um, um, 
me a little bit of background of um, exactly how donors and investors uh, differ. Because essentially, if you're an investor, it's pretty clear. You get formal rights over a bunch of things, OK? Um, and then what exactly are you getting when you are a donor, OK? So it's a promise. It's a mug in a mug. <laughs> and so essentially, it's um, uh, what, what's, what's the key? key uh, what's the trade there? Essentially, I, I'm bringing money in exchange for what exactly? Okay, so it's uh, mm -hmm. um, that I think could help. Uh, Uh, all right. Is there? We have like uh, time for like one more question. If there is it, then or final reflections. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sum all this up for us. <laughs> yeah. So we're, I, yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate all the comments that you have given to me, and I. This is uh, actually the first essay of my dissertation, and I also have to address this further exploring, second, further exploring um, characteristics of the founder and organizations of nonprofits organizations in receiving philanthropy donations, their signaling effect. Oh, cool. So this, um, come back and do that too, yeah, please. That identity this could be um, a kind of signals, but there might be other signals. And the third one will be to test the signals of human capital and their social media presence and jointly and uh, independently. How do those signals um, influence um, social enterprises, resource acquisition in philanthropic donations and uh, debt funding? Um, so yeah, that would be cool. also that's interesting. Really, yeah, wonderful. That's three great topics. It's yeah. wonderful. Look forward to your next two Come back. Come back, really. This was, look at how engaged you got. This was not easy. So, congratulations. I was about to propose a substitute for me doing. <laughs>